Feel Good Fathers, welcome to today. Great conversation with you with my man, Wayne Boatwright. Uh, he's got a sub stack. Uh, link will be down in the description where he's learning and making sense of his life in a public way. Welcome to the show, Wayne. Thank you, Jay. It's good to be here. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, can't wait. We've had a we had a couple back and forth before we went on air. Uh, let us uh, give us a little bit of a a hint, a little bit of a background on you and and what we're going to talk about today. Um, well, I I think that what I've discovered from my professional atheist educated elite class that I used to belong to, um, I think many of them consider me a black sheep. And I consider myself more of a black swan. So I'm hoping we can discuss both why those perceptions are, are acceptable, uh, given the, the fact pattern that I've led. Um, but I've also led many different lives. I, I think I'm the quintessential American story. I was raised by a single mother with a half brother, raised in rent control housing. I've lived above a gas station when they used to allow that. I've lived in a, a trailer park. Uh, I shared a bedroom with my brother while I was growing up, and yet I was able to keep my act together, get an education. Um, ultimately, uh, I went to an Ivy League law school, so I was able to graduate from Cornell Law School and became a, a lawyer. Not a not the type of lawyer you see on TV. I was a business lawyer, not a litigator or a criminal lawyer like you see in the courtrooms. But I worked a lot with uh, corporations that. Uh, we're global. I, I worked, uh, I was based in Seoul, Korea for six years, for example, as a foreign legal consultant, had a global position with Accenture, if you're familiar with that consulting firm, um, and then got bit by the startup bug because I'm based in San Francisco. And I, I worked with Silicon Valley for well over a decade in a myriad of different startups. Uh, so professionally, I've had a, a range of different components, but that's probably not the thing that, uh, that prompted us to have this conversation. Yes, probably, probably not, but uh, great background. Absolutely love it. So where are you at today? Interesting. Um, I'm going to be very detailed. I, I find that as part of our conversation and, and in this conversation, you'll find I'll use a lot of metaphors and maybe a little flowery language. I'm doing that not to sound like I know what I'm talking about per se. I'm, I'm trying to communicate with your subconscious mind not just your rational conscious mind that, that you think controls you. Uh, if you've ever learned the concept of the rider and the elephant, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. That subconscious mind is the elephant. It actually does a heck of a lot more control over us than the rider thinks. Um, and so I'm sitting in a wonderful one-bedroom apartment, um, and I live alone. And to be honest, I don't do much socially and I'm happy about that. My solitude is something that I savor and I'm grateful for. Uh, it, it keeps me at peace and it keeps me balanced. Um, but there's a reason for it. And the reason for it was that I spent six years in San Quentin State Prison, uh, where I was convicted of gross negligent vehicular manslaughter, which means that I was driving drunk and I killed someone. And I've got to tell you, if you're in a dorm with 200 men in double bunks, uh, you really appreciate your solitude when you can get out of that environment. I yeah. never want to have a roommate again. I never want to live in communal housing. I'm grateful to have a, an apartment. But it is an apartment, and I have to sublet it because I can't afford to rent an apartment or a home. Because unfortunately, even though I'm a, I, I was a lawyer, once you've committed a felony as I did, you're disbarred. And the reality of my life is I've had 28 different jobs in the five years since I've been home. The main source of income I have right now is I work at a server for a catering company. Mm. Um, events I used to go to, I'm now the server of. You know, when I'd work at a non, when I get a nonprofit event and donate to that nonprofit, I'm now the guy who's serving you your cocktail or your dinner at that event on a regular basis. And that's the reality of my existence right now. I'm one of the consequences I think is underappreciated of returning citizens is that life is. Uh, you don't return to a life after you've served sentence. In many ways, your criminal conviction is a lifelong punishment. What kind of impact has this had on you and your family? 
Um, I think a great impact, as it should. But one I hope has stopped being an open wound and become a scar. A scar you can be proud of. I, I kind of look at, um, I made people say that life happens to them. So there's this kind of victim culture that exists in our world and life happened to them. It's like, no, life happens for you. There's something you had to learn, good or bad, and, and it happens for you. And so that mindset allows whatever traumatic experience you may have had to not continue to traumatize you afterwards, but it's a scar. And you should be proud of your scars. How else do you know who you are unless you face challenges and how you deal with those challenges? I think the comfort that comes from our uh, existence of abundance that we have in the United States. And again, I lived in Korea for six years. I lived in Argentina for two years. I've traveled around the world. I know how other people live. We live in a culture of abundance. Our poorest people have air conditioners and TVs and cell phones for heaven's sakes. The greatest problem in America is type 2 diabetes and, and obesity, not starvation. We have abundance at every level. Um, I think we often forget that we need challenges to find out who we are. And there's no doubt I've had challenges in my life, whether it be my childhood um, in, with, a, again, a single mother who hadn't graduated high school or committing a crime like gross negligent vehicular manslaughter or coming home from that. And finding out um, my former community didn't welcome me back and that I had to start all over again uh, as, as an adult. And, and to be honest, I started with, with just like I began life, with nothing. Um, one of the consequences of my crime was my, my wife at the time, who, mother of my two children, uh, asked me for a divorce uh, six months into my prison sentence. And again, I served over six years. Uh, I would contend in many ways my crime uh, destroyed two families. The, the family of my victim, who was a grandmother, mother, wife, daughter to her family, and my family. For they lost a, a father, a husband, um, a provider as well. Um, and so those consequences are real and have been significant and are, are nothing to be ashamed of. They are what they are. But I, I look for it to be a scar, not an open wound. And that's what I hope for my children. Uh, my children are now 18 and 20. My son is a sophomore at college back east. My daughter's a senior at high school back east, even though they were both born and raised in San Francisco. And, you know, I, I can contend that regardless of all the challenges I've had, and I, I think I'd love to discuss how I've overcome many of those and the tools that I've used. Uh, one of your questions was, what is a tool or what is a concept you'd like to share? And I want to get into that. But, you know, um, before I started our podcast, since it's on fatherhood, I, I went to my phone and I, I counted the communications I'd had with my children over the past week. And I'd had 200 communications with my children over this past week. Um, I also had dinner with my daughter. She's home on spring break. Um, and I got to hear about her life and her adventure and what her spring break was like when she traveled, uh, with her friends and what she hopes for with getting into a, a university. And, you know, she's in that stress period right now. I don't know how old your children are, but you know, this is the time when you start getting the acceptance and rejection letters and she's a, a stress ball. Uh, as she should be as a senior in high school. But I'm glad I can be there for her and that she can share that stress with me and she's comfortable doing that. And I think that's a testament to how strong our relationship is. That's awesome. Uh, I, I'm really curious about how old were they when you went to prison and what was it like maintaining that relationship while you were uh, in prison? Um. When I committed my crime, they were uh, five and seven, very young, very young. Um, being coming from a a professional status, I was able to not 
be required to stay in county jail during my uh, trial process. I was able to um, go home. So I had about a year with them. But to be real, to be honest, the, the crime was a head on collision. I was so drunk. Um, I blacked out, so I don't remember any of this. But I was going the wrong way on a freeway and had a head on collision with someone. That's how drunk I was at the time. Um, and so my injuries were significant as well. I spent 90 days in the hospital, uh, uh, over 400 miles away from my home. And when I came home, I was in a, a wheelchair and, you know, then crutches, a walker, things like that. So, and on a lot of morphine. So to be honest, even though I was home for a year, I wouldn't contend. I had as rich of a relationship with my children as I would have hoped for. As I was, I, I knew I was going to go to prison. I, I should go to prison. I, for example, I didn't go to, uh, again, like on TV, I didn't go to trial. I did what's called a plea bargain. Uh, well, I accepted the DA's, you know, we negotiated and I accepted the DA's position and that was accepted in court. I wasn't going to waste the state's resources to, to go to a full trial. Um, but I was able to spend time with my kids and I would say that is a, a rare gift for many people who are heading to prison. Many of them are kept in county jail while they're awaiting trial if they can't afford what's called bail. Uh, again, not people of our class were able to afford bail, but most right. of the people who are in prison cannot. And I think that's a travesty because they are not able to prepare their family for their incarceration to come. And I was able to, um, but they were very young and I can't pretend I had any idea how to prepare them. I, I had destroyed my life. Uh, I was trying to deal with that as well as physically recover, let alone helping them prepare for what was going to come. Um, so you said, thank you uh, for sharing that. And then you said it was about six years and you came back. So they're at five and seven, they're roughly going to be early teenagers, say 12, 13, 14, as a guess. So they're prime time high school. What was it? So you, you, so what was it like reconnecting with them when you came out? I'm not going to go there yet. Um, okay. All right. Because, <laughs> because. When you rent the tapestry of relationships as I had with my crime and by disappearing from their lives, uh, developmentally, that's the way they perceived it. Emotionally, I abandoned them is the way sure. they perceived it. I tried to prepare them to understand I was serving sentence, that it was an obligation I had as a citizen because of the crime I had committed, that that's what the state demanded of me, and I was going to honor that commitment to serve sentence. They can't understand those concepts. I just abandoned them. They had uh, financially everything changed. You know, they they had their own bedrooms when I was uh, committed my crime. They had to share a bedroom by the time uh, financially to prepare them for for living in a single parent household versus a two income house, for example. That's what they knew. That was they developmentally could understand. But as with any tapestry, you can really weave it if you've got the opportunity and you've got the threads. And I have to give full credit to my ex for her willingness to co-parent with me in that she allowed me and helped me in a myriad of different ways to reweave that tapestry of our relationship with, with my children. And I will eternally be grateful to her for that, that she allowed me that opportunity and that she encouraged it and facilitated it in a myriad of different ways. For example, um, she continued to bring our children to visit me when I was in San Quentin. There are 30 prisons in the California state prison system. Uh, I worked every lever I knew to be sentenced to the one closest to San Francisco, which happens to be San Quentin State Prison, uh, an infamous prison. It's where California's death row is. It's, it's full of um, uh, people who at one time, I would contend, were the most heinous, had committed the most heinous criminal acts. Um, it's, it's full of murderers and pedophiles and drug dealers and everything you can imagine. 
uh, at that level. Um, one of the groups, for example, at San Quentin, and this is kind of a transition uh, that I participated in, was called Victim Offender Dialogue. Um, and it was eight individuals in that group, uh, two outside facilitators and one inmate facilitator. All eight of us had taken at least one life, if not multiple lives, with our crime. Um, so that's, that's where I was going. And so you would think, why would you ever bring your kids to a visiting room there? And I would say, if you don't bring your kids to visit, if you don't take every opportunity to spend time with your children, you're not reweaving that tapestry that you've damaged by your divorce or by your separation or by your imprisonment. Because at that age, it's the simple thing of sharing a meal, of playing a game, of sitting next to each other and talking that is essential for kids at their developmental level that you maintain that relationship, regardless of the cost. Um, and in prison, you don't have the advent of electronic communication. I would contend that the electronic world is now a digital realm. We actually reside in it for a significant portion of our existence. It's not merely a means of communication. It's a realm. Sure. And I mentioned how I use that with them now, but when you're in prison, you don't have access to any of that. Prison is a time-locked past. It's like 1980. You have broadcast TV. You use uh, what's equivalent to a, an old pay phone if you want to talk to somebody. You have to make a collect call. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have visits, uh, which are short in duration and not nearly as private as you would like them to be. You know, in our, in our educated uh, class that we belong to, we have the respect of not listening to other people's conversations for accept, acceptance. For example, you know, we come from a culture of abundance, so collaboration is what we attempt to do to succeed. When you deal with people who come from a culture of scarcity, which believe in competition as the only means of success, um, it's a lot more difficult to have private moments because they listen to everything you say. They don't respect your privacy. If they can get an advantage by listening in on what you're saying, they're going to take it because they come from a competitive mindset. Um, and you don't think that way. And so you have to be very careful and circumspect a lot of times in conversations you have. For example, on that collect call that I talked about, the collect call in my dorm had four pay phones that are used the whole time they're open. You have to reserve the time you're going to call. And it has a sign right above them. Please keep your hand out of your pants when you're using the phone. And I can trust you. A lot of the conversation on those phones are pornographic because most of these guys are thinking at that level. Um, mm. when they're talking hmm. and I don't want to listen to their conversations, but that doesn't mean they aren't listening to mine when I'm talking to my 10 year old daughter about what she's doing. So you have to be circumspect, but still you have to have those communications, make that weekly call. If you can have that visit, if you can organize it, if you're incarcerated and for those fathers who are divorced and, and don't live in the home, find a way to physically interact with your children beyond those calls, be in, be in their presence as much as you can. I think there's a, I mean, there's a lot to process here. So this is, this is interesting. I think there's a sorry. lot to, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> lots, sorry, don't worry about it. It's, uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm reflecting on, you know, we, uh, uh, Ryan Holiday talks about, he's like the daily stoic, daily dad guy talks about garbage time and there's no, there's no bad time. There's no good time. There's just time. And it, it just in hearing the story of, of sort of what you've gone through, I think it's a little bit of perspective on what, what we take for granted. And I think this is like, if I, you know, as a feel good father listening to this, I'm just like, okay, what are, what are the areas in my life where, um, I'm listening to you, Wayne, tell me your story and how am I as mercenary as possible, how am I maximizing the, the impact I can have, uh, the positive impact I can have on my family by paying attention to what you're saying and what you've gone through for that 20 minutes, for that five minutes, you know, whereas in, in my situation with my kids as the age that they are, it's, you know, I have them all weekend, all night, 
you know, they go to school or they're in daycare and, and that kind of stuff. So it's, it's an interesting perspective and I appreciate uh, it. Uh, how old are your kids again? If you don't mind me asking. Yeah, sure. 11 turning 12 and then one and a half turning two. And, and when they're that young, the half year is super important. It's a big deal. <laughs> it's a big deal. <laughs> so developmental issue is a big deal. I love it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would, uh, I would challenge you uh, on your statement that you have that time with them. Um, the digital realm exists and you sure. live in it a lot more often than you probably realize. So are you with them or are you on your phone or on your oh, computer? Oh, I'm with them. I, that's the, that's the feel good way <laughs> is uh, I, I make it a point that on time with them that I'm not on my phone. I make Good. it a point that when we're watching that awful kid show that is written for kids that's not, that that doesn't have much uh, value that we're at least engaging in conversation and paying attention to the characters and what's going on. Uh, yeah. it, you know, that's something that that's part of the feel good fatherhood community is that just put your phone down and get off your computer sit sit with there watch the terrible movie watch the cringy show watch that kind of stuff because that moment can create an opportunity to reflect on provide values discuss the morality of what's going on discuss their opinion of what's going on and help help them and basically help my daughter as we were doing this together navigate and figure out what she thinks about what's happening yes yes that, so so that is that mm -hmm. is something that we discuss in the community that is something that i definitely believe uh you know my, my classic example is that we found a way to watch a lot of the star treks together star trek next generation which is my star trek uh, she loves Janeway and Voyager. So we've watched Voyager twice through. We've watched TNG. Well, once through when she was really young, but once recently. And it was great to have those discussion points about, well, what do you think about what just happened here? What do you think what happened here? How, which characters do you like? Who do you enjoy watching? You know, and then kind of allowing her to get curious and explore what's happening on screen, mm -hmm. what's happening there, because I'm completely aware of the digital addiction and the digital, uh, the difficulty in putting down your phone. Cause I recognize yeah. that I'd rather not have that. I didn't like, I'd rather have this time with her because when she's turning 12, it's another year or two before she's mostly living her own life. You know, when, once she hit yeah. high school, I, I fully expect that she's going to have, she's going to be full of extracurricular activities. If she does, if not that full of friends, full of other things that young teenage daughters do. I don't, I don't know what, what young teenage girls do. Well, we're going to figure it out and, uh, uh, uh you know, we're going to figure that out uh -huh. and just, I can do my best to, uh, help her as a fathership and help her on the side and be curious about what she's doing and be curious about how she's experiencing life. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I, uh, the, the term of art I like to use, uh, this tools I was talking about, and now there's, you, you've now added a third one that I want to talk about, but the first one is the concept of meet them where they are. Um, you have to meet them where they are developmentally. And if they're one and a half, meet them where they are. <laughs> um, and if they're 11 or 12, meet them where they are, right? So uh, that that is very different. And developmentally, you need to be responsive to that. And that doesn't mean you don't encourage them to continue to develop, as you say, asking them questions. Star Trek's a great example. If you want to talk about um, uh, trauma and PTSD, and understanding what this means for our, our returning servicemen and also for all of the incarcerated, by the way. Yeah. Uh, there's something called an ACE score, the Adverse Childhood Experience Score. ACE score is the highest predictor of incarceration, teenage pregnancy, dropping out of high school that there is. The higher your score, the more likely you are to have these adverse outcomes or maladaptions. Um, and a lot of that is a form of PTSD. PTSD, by the way, I, I think people misunderstand a lot of these concepts. They think the traumatic event itself is the issue. No. Trauma is how you respond 
to the traumatic event. Yes. There are many women who have been raped that lead normal lives and find somebody else to fall in love with and have a, a normal life. And they don't stay a victim their whole life and hate men and decide not to have relationships with the men or don't trust any man because they've been late. That's how they're responding to the traumatic act. And so the question is how you help them respond to these things in healthy ways. Uh, how do they, healing again, doesn't mean the scar doesn't go away. There's a scar. There should be. Uh, you have to acknowledge it, but it shouldn't stay an open wound. How, um, um, on this topic, so how have you, how have you helped your, your kids with work through their trauma? I think this would be a good, good thing. A, a great example. So meeting my daughter where she was, for example. Uh, she became a huge Rick Reardon fan who wrote the whole philanthropy, starting with Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief. My daughter uh, loves that series too. The whole series. Yeah. The whole series. So she was reading them while I was incarcerated. So the first thing I did is I went to the prison library when I found that out and I checked out every Rick Reardon book I could. Did I want to read about Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thieves? They're not bad. I did it because I needed to meet my daughter where she was. I needed to have metaphors and narratives and stories that she was familiar with and resonated with her and be able to take those stories and extend them uh, to get her to a good place, not just where she is. So. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, these books use the, the pantheon of all of the ancient gods across all of the different cultures now, because he's written, I'm sure, 20, 30 books. The Greek gods, the Roman version of the Greek gods, the Egyptian gods, the Aztec gods, the Norse gods, all of them are talked about in different facets. But one of those stories is the story of Odysseus and, um, his great journey home and all the adventures he had after he had fought in the Peloponnesian Wars and, and the Iliad and the Odyssey is mm -hmm. the one that the Odyssey is what it's called. And, and so I told her I was very similar to Odysseus. You know, I had committed this, I was gone for a long time. I had many misadventures, but just like him, when I got home, nobody recognized me mm -hmm. and nobody knew who I was. And so that was a connection I could make to her Rick Reardon fans to try to give her some context of what my life was like and who I was as a person. That I'd learned things through all of these adventures because that's really what the Odyssey is about. What did it teach Odysseus? And then what did it, can it teach us? What did the Rick Reardon books teach? And these gods and these demigods teach these children. And Love it. so I was able to meet her where she was, but then extend that learning. Um, Deep Space Nine, if you want to use the, the Star Trek roles, in one of the early episodes, uh, Cisco, who's the captain, uh, meets with the godlike events of people, and they kept asking him why he lived uh, in an event where his wife had died. Um, uh, and that's an example of post-traumatic stress. He was living in the traumatic event of her being killed in some war that was going on. And that he was the, uh, for context, that was um, Captain Picard became the Borg. And so if we look at the timeline of Deep Space Nine versus the next generation, I'm sorry, I'm a Trekkie. Here we go. So uh, what ends up happening is that Captain Picard becomes a Borg, leads an invasion on Earth. And Cisco is stationed, Cisco with his family. So in the Star Trek universe, when they're on, their Starfleet, when they're on their, their warships, uh, the family typically is with them. And so they're on the ship. So they're on the ship. Cisco, I, I forget which position he is on the ship, but his ship is basically defeated by the Borg. So the, the, the Borg cube hits the fleet. It decimates the fleet, right? It's only the next generation, only uh, Riker and the whole crew and Data and, all, and, and Beverly Crusher that get figure out how to turn off the cube and do all that kind of stuff. So when we hit the Deep Space Nine and we learn about what Cisco's going through, it, he's very much a combat vet, right? He's very much a combat veteran. He very much lost his family in that context. Uh, and I believe that that 
Uh, I, I'm less familiar with the overall Deep Space Nine and Trekkies, please forgive me. Uh, but I believe in the beginning, that is a core part of his identity, is that he hates Picard, because I believe very early he meets Picard. And uh, the, the, the Enterprise actually goes to Deep Space Nine, like I think season one or season two or something like that. And that uh, O'Brien and Worf and the whole, because I know that they kind of go back and forth. So those are engineers and, and Worf is the chief security officer of the Enterprise, end up working, living uh, and being on Deep Space Nine. But they do have an interaction and, um, and it is super clear. When you watch Cisco. it is super clear, clear that he has unmitigated rage. But what happened, he uh, d- does not move to a place of forgiveness. And I want to qualify those statements are not judgmental of the character for what, what's going on, simply fact. And of like what you see on Literally. screen, I am not sure, because I'm less familiar with it, whether or not he resolves those situations. But I do know that as a core part of his character. So please, so please, yeah. he, is, he does go through PTSD. And in fact, um, while we're on it, Picard is very, very similarly has PTSD the entire rest of the run from becoming Locutus, from becoming a Borg and transforming in that way. Uh, sure. and, and, and many, there are many situations where that comes up and there's, there's, it, it is a core part of his, it's a central part of his character all the way through to the most recent, uh, season of Picard. So, um, uh, uh, shameless plug. If, if you, if you're a flippant father, you, you should definitely be watching Star Trek because it's, it's a fantastic series. <laughs> I am. Um, I love that, and and um, I believe in the concept of uh, both meeting them where they are, and what I like to call the enlightened witness. So the enlightened witness would be you explaining that PTSD to your daughter and discussing that with her, right? Meeting them where they are is watching the show with them, right? Both these concepts overlap and they work well. And a parent, um, we don't have, don't. I'm not saying instruct your daughter. Uh, or instruct your children. I think people misconstrue that. You don't need to tell your kids what to do that much. You need to be an enlightened witness to their life. But that means helping them recognize things that they're experiencing and what they're going through. We're helping um, them. We're helping them build mental models. We're helping yes. them navigate the world. We're helping them build habits and routines. There are moments when you should step in and dictate. No, that's not correct. Yes, this is correct in some areas and, and the, but the challenge is, I think in the modern context of parenting is that we've decided that all of that is incorrect. I, I, it, it just, yes. it's faulty to, to have something and someone that you love and just let them do whatever you want. You would never, you would never invest into a dog or rescue a dog because I have both rescued and bought a dog. I would never do that and let them have their way with the house. You would yeah. never do that. You would never, yeah. you would never allow your dogs to chew whatever they want, poop wherever they want, pee wherever they want, do whatever they want, bark however much they want. You would never allow that. And mm-hmm. uh, this certainly is not me comparing to kids because kids are much, much more elevated, have much more responsibility. But you would, it, it, it's a, it's a false premise as a parent and definitely as a feel good father to pretend that you're going to allow your kids to do whatever the heck they want. You would yeah. not, you would not, as if they were adults, sit by idly and watch them shoot themselves up with heroin. You yeah. would not, you would yeah. not be a good parent. You would, yeah. you would not, you would not, if you knew they were getting involved in, in gang activity, you would not be a good parent if you did not point out and do everything you could to prevent them from going and doing that. The enlightened would, witness. Yeah. Yes. You would, you would not in the same tone when they're young, you, you would not allow them to just take their hand and put it directly on a frying, a hot frying pan full of oil on your stove. You would not do that. And so I think that, uh, those are extreme versions, but in the same, same token, you should not allow them to treat you with disrespect in your house. You should not allow Mm. them to treat your spouse with disrespect in your house. That some of these regular, small, minor activities and these big, huge, major activities part of the feel good father way is providing that boundary as you're saying that enlightened witness I, I love this idea and that it's there are points to say yes no these are expectations versus what do you think yeah and you're exp- like you're not <laughs> you're not just telling them what to do right i i find that as an older man 
uh, as I watch generations develop, um, uh, most of the moms I know are Uber type A. Uh, mm. They plan all their kids' play dates. Their days are scheduled from one and a half, by the way, um, literally. And I find that many, many parents appear to be trying to keep their children safe rather than learning, having their children learn to be brave. You want brave children, not, not safe children. Brave children in the sense that, that they know the risk they're taking and they do it voluntarily. And they know when not to take a risk. I'm not saying they should always do anything they want, but you want them to be brave about it, not just safe all the time where they don't know where their limits are. I want kids who test boundaries. It doesn't mean the boundary doesn't exist. I love uh. that my eldest is defiant. I love that she, that she, it, it is one of the, the, my most pride and joy and the hardest points of my day is that when she's defiant, when she's pushing, pushing back, when she's forcing the boundary, because I know what's happening is that she's like, she's standing up, she's asserting herself, she's saying what she needs, she's articulating herself effectively. And it's just this clash of, of egos and parent and child. And those kind of discussions are what happens in the real world. She's and being so, self-trust. She's, she's being self-expressed. Self yeah, yes. You know, and her ability is, to feel comfortable telling yeah. you what she really thinks is what yes. you want, right? Exactly, uh, yeah. And it doesn't mean you're always going to say no. Uh, you just want, but you want to encourage her to be brave about what exactly. she says. Um, so I'm going to talk about TV for a second. But before I do that, um, if you've, if you haven't read Alice Miller yet, uh, given your activist mindset about being a parent, that's where I learned the concept of enlightened witness. Alice Miller was a Swiss psychologist who practiced for 30 years. She wasn't just an academic who wrote some books. And her uh, most famous book is called The Drama of the Gifted Child, uh, which isn't a precise translation of what she meant. It came from German. She's Swiss, but it was written in German and then translated into English. But the drama of the gifted child is an essential read for any parent to understand the consequences of their actions as a parent and how the developmental level of the children, how the children are perceiving what the parent's doing. Because many mm -hmm. times parents get ahead of themselves and they're teaching things that shouldn't be taught yet to their yes. kids. You, there's a right time for it. And I think many times parents don't know what that right time is and they're actually causing damage to their kids. Um, mm -hmm. For TV's sake, um, I, I have found nothing in the last 20 years on American TV that I trust. And I would include the later versions of the Star Trek universe in that. I don't trust them to teach values that I want my children to learn. Well, I have found shows that consistently, almost universally, teach values of respect your parents, get an education, work hard, tell the truth, accept your faults, recognize that everybody has them, that nobody is just evil and good. The good people have faults as much as the bad people, and they both need to learn about them. Mm -hmm. consistently, you will find those. And again, remember, I spent six years in Korea on Korean dramas. Mm -hmm. And Korean dramas are universally available, whether it's on Amazon Prime, Apple TV+, Plus, Netflix, Hulu, doesn't matter. You virtually don't have to pick a show. I could recommend some, but don't. Turn them on. Try to convince your daughter to watch a Korean drama with you. You will be so happy you did because the values that are teached universally in the Korean culture are the values I want my children to learn. And I am confident you would agree are values that are universal. Uh, get an education, work hard, learn from your mistakes, admit your mistakes. Um, and the fact that the characters are complex. Today, characters are always good and good or evil. American characters are very simplistic and you want a complex character because people are complex. How else can you learn forgiveness? If you think of somebody as always evil, 
How could you forget them? You shouldn't forget them. And we're being brainwashed into thinking of people as either good or evil. Um, when we should look at people as being complex. One show is called The Startup, and it teaches about uh, 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 the idea of creating a, uh, a, an accelerator or a think tank concept where you can, our startups kind of will go and learn the skills they need. And two sisters are in there. And, and one is shown as good and one is shown as, as selfish. And both of them learn that they're not either of those things. And they learned to love each other again, even though they were separated as young children. One went with the father and one went with the mother. And the, the differences that they had in that construct, that's an example of a show. I said I wasn't going to give examples. The startup, great example of a show. Um, and how boys and girls can develop a healthy relationship, not based just on Twitter suggestions. Well, I think, uh, I think that's uh, TikTok suggestions. I said Twitter, TikTok suggestions. She knows how old I am. Um, watch Korean dramas if you want, if, if she wants to watch new shows and not watch uh, Star Trek The Next Generation for the fourth time. Uh, I recommend that. Yeah, it's, it, it's, a, and I appreciate that. I think that the, the core, I love that there is good, there are good examples of medium out there that can make it happen. And I think that the core skill would be how do we teach them to think about what they're watching, not be a passive participant. And that's the, the core thing for me is when, if she gets to the point where she can watch a show and decide this is for me or, or not for me, or I'm enjoying this or I'm not enjoying this, and understand and articulate why that's the case, then what can happen is then she can then, I know that now she can extend that discernment to her friend group, to what's happening in school, to what her teachers and professors are saying, to uh, what, her, what her friends are saying. And so uh, the core skill is evaluating the medium. Uh, and the only way that you can learn how to critique medium is if you have somebody next to you teaching you the skill and asking you the right questions because they will parrot uh, us. They will model us. And if we, cause I, I remember my daughter, my daughter once criticized me, she said, why do you always think so deeply about everything you're watching? And I said, because I really pay attention to what, what I let into my head. And I really pay attention to the values of the people that I'm watching. And if I don't agree with what I'm watching, I don't watch it. Oh, you took advantage of that moment. Congratulations. Kudos. That's great. Yeah. That's a wonderful moment. But she was open to it by asking the question. Yeah. Right. You were yeah. trying to shove it into her head. She was open to it. And yeah. you need that. You need yeah. that. I love it. I love it. I yeah. I like that. I I um as long as you acknowledge that you're going counter current. Uh we live in a world where nobody's allowed to be bored anymore. Sure. Um, we're taught to accept entertainment as our default state. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a strong crime you have to fight against. And, and I think it, it might be harder than I think a lot of parents appreciate because that is ubiquitous. It's, it's everywhere all the time. You're not a, you are meant to be entertained. Everything is meant. That is your purpose. You're a passive receptor. It's the concept that I like to use. And you argue that being an active listener is essential and not merely a passive receptor, but you're going against current because the current wants you to be passive receptors. And that's well, why. It, and, and I think society is fighting against that with this long form podcast. Neither of us are passive. We're having an interaction. We're right. not agreeing on everything. We're, we're, we have a nuanced understanding of these different things and we're, we're sharing that. So th there is something against that, but it's not the current. The current is entertainment 24 7. It, it definitely is the feel good fathered way. It definitely is the, I think we talked about this before, put your phone down, engage with what's happening, watch, watch the terrible show, read the books, watch, watch what they're doing, uh, help them make sense of the world and help them, help them navigate. That's, that is our job. And, and the hope, even though I was away from my children for over six years, physically, they did come visit me. Thank you, X, for honoring that and not vilifying me. 
co-parenting is essential. I've maintained that co-parenting relationship since I've come home. Uh, my ex is remarried, but she and her current husband invite me to Thanksgiving dinner and Christmas dinner with mm. the kids. Um, just last week, I have to brag, sorry. Um, my daughter just turned 18, and I was trying to figure out what to do as a birthday present. And um, her mom, uh, the ex, I like to call her, um, said, well, hey, why don't you repaint her bedroom? She she hates her bedroom color. It's too dark. And I, the light bulb went off. I said, absolutely. And so I repainted my daughter's bedroom walls um, mm. a, a lighter color that she would hopefully be happier with. And I was allowed, I had a key to the house. I was allowed to go in and out while they were working to do that paint job. They trust me that much. So co-parenting and, and developing a trust relationship is essential and not vilifying your, your ex-spouse in any way ever, especially in front of or in any way by the kids, is a warning I would give any parent. I don't care what your reasoning is. I don't care how justified you are. Um, uh, don't. Don't. It's not the kid's fault. Don't, don't make your kids carry your water, your problem. Um, and I've developed that relationship with my ex and have that, and I'm grateful for that. And I believe uh, since my daughter came home on spring break, we've gone out and had dinner and I found our conversations to be much richer, much deeper at that dinner uh, because I think she was shocked when she found out that I, I remember I used to be a lawyer. Painting a, a wall, painting a room may be easy for a lot of guys, but it's not something she expected from me. And I was grateful to have that opportunity and to do it and to do it as well as I could. I, um, I mentioned that I had the 27... 28 jobs since I've been back and the one at catering, I actually did the catering job over the summer with both of my kids because mm. I wanted them to not have an allowance. I wanted them to learn the value of money by working. So they work with me. That's at awesome. Catering company. And at Father's Day, I asked the kids to tell me, you know, what have they learned from me in their life? That was the gift I wanted from them. And my son said, well, you know, dad, I, I came back from summer and he had worked two summers. He's older uh, at the, the catering company. And he said, I came down from summer and it was amazing that everybody, the owner, the chefs, the back of the house, the front of the house, the captains, the fellow servers, everybody loves you and respects you and want to work with you and tell me how great you are and how you, you make their lives easier. Because I'm a big believer in, you know, being the, uh, like Joseph in the Code of Many Colors for our religious friends who are listening. Um, you know, you should be the best you can be at whatever you are, wherever you're doing. Whether you're a slave or the counselor or the pharaoh, it doesn't matter. Do it the best you can. Be that example for your children. And he told me that. He told me that he saw that. And you want to make a dad proud? Wow. I was, I went to Cornell Law School. I used, I've met Jeff Bezos. I've met Michael Bloomberg. I've met George Soros. My kids don't know that. They know me as a guy working in a catering company, for heaven's sakes. Cat sitting for friends and hustling to pay the rent. But he could still say he was, he was amazed and he was impressed and that he's learned to be that example, to work hard, to do the best he can. And that's what I wanted, and I'm grateful for that. And it doesn't matter the venue. Um, I don't have to introduce him to Jeff Bezos. I'll go to Michael Bloomberg's Christmas party like I've been invited to, but I can show him how to be a good coworker um, and how to help others and to be respected for it by everybody from the owner of the catering company on down. Um, that's important. That's valuable. Uh, and the name brand stuff is irrelevant. It, it's just ego stroking if you use it. Um, and so I was able to do that. I love it, Wayne. And uh, uh, to to wrap up, I, I think we've had so many great gems in this conversation. What's sort of a, a, a final comment or a final thought for our co-parenting folks or folks that are, or folks that are struggling with their kids? You know, what, what do we kind of want to leave them with uh, for this conversation? Um, uh, 
America as a, as a meritocracy celebrates success uh, in many ways too much. Um, we don't all have to become billionaires. We don't all have to be rich. I think what I'd leave them with is the realization that if they meet their children where they are, if they're an enlightened witness to their children's life, their children's front row is another way of characterizing it, like at a concert. Um, go to every event your child has. Read every paper your child wrote. Comment at every teacher conference. Tell your children what you learned at a teacher parent conference. Every single one of them. You don't realize how valuable that will be in your children's lives, whether they say they did it or not. They need to know that you care about those things. Not judgmentally. Not telling them what to do. Be the witness. Be the front row. Participate in their lives, especially those public events where you can sh they can look back over their shoulder and see you there. One of the greatest gifts I ever had was when my son was a senior. My son's a big baseball fan. Before I went to prison, I took him to every Giants game I could in San Francisco. It's San Francisco Giants. And when I say I took him to a game, remember, he was seven years old. When I took him to a game, we'd go two hours early to go to batting practice and bring his mitt. And we'd stand in the outfield, bleachers, to see if he could get some fly balls. He knows every baseball player in the Giants organization down to single A. We talk about baseball almost daily. That's where I meet him where he is. And I had to learn about baseball. And trust me, uh, I grew up in L.A. I had Dodger blue blood before he became a San Francisco Giants fan. I couldn't care less about the Dodgers. Giants all the way, my friend. They're, they're the team that matters. I know all about them. I share those conversations with my son. And of course, we talk about the Warriors and the 49ers. But the point is the Giants are his passion. We're going to go to opening day this year in May. Do you know how excited I am to go to opening day with my son? That's awesome. My 20 year old son to opening day. Yeah. He wants to go with me, not just his friends. He wants to go with his dad and yeah. share that. Meet them where they are, be their front row, cheer them on in any way. And it could even be watching, even them playing a video game. During COVID, my son got hooked on FIFA, which is the soccer game on Xbox. Yep. I didn't know the difference between a penalty and a foul in soccer. I was like, you know, uh, Ted Lasso, if you know what that show is on, on, I don't know, I think it's on Apple. Um, I didn't, you know, I didn't know what offside was. I now know everything about the Premier League and then the Champions League where all the leagues send their best teams to to play. I know all about them, but I don't have to be the, the Chelsea fan that my son is. I'm a Tottenham Hotspur fan and we'll talk shit to each other about those two teams when they play each other and we'll know who the players are and what's going on in those teams. I mean, him what he is, but I'm also an enlightened witness. When he was playing that stupid game on Xbox, I sat with him and cheered him on and questioned what he was doing and oohed and awed and got depressed when he missed and lost because he just needed to know I was watching him. And I hadn't gotten the opportunity to do that when he was growing up. I only got to go to his baseball games one week when I flew into his school and got to watch him as a senior play baseball. But I went to every practice that week I was there and I cheered him on and I got to know who his teammates were, his coaches were, and to be in the, the crowd and cheer him on that one week and was the greatest gift I ever had to be home and be able to watch him play baseball. Um, awesome. Do that for your kids and it'll go a long way to, to improving your relationship with them. Be their front row. Awesome. Uh, Wayne, everybody.